Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new video. Today, we are having a podcast, we're having a conversation uh, with George O, oh, a former ballet dancer, ballet teacher. He has the blog Ballet in Motion that you can see right now on the screen. And he shares um, everything that he teaches and everything that he has learned as a teacher and as a dancer online. Uh, we met actually. I, I created a video uh, talking about one of the topics that he was discussing in his blog. And so I use his information as reference. I thought it was amazing and innovative. And that's why uh, we started a, a conversation online through Instagram. And he sent me all of his work and many of the things that he has been working on. And I found it, uh, as I'm saying, really inspiring and really innovative. And so I, I asked him if he wanted to record a podcast because I think it's, it's great if we can get this information out there for more people and that uh, we can see ballet from a different um, view with a different lens. I think it's really important nowadays that we, we share the information and that we, we see uh, things not just from how one teacher tells you or how um, the people that is close to you tells you, but that we can use this platform. We can use social media. We can use the, um, all of all of this information in our advantage. So thank you so much, George, for joining me and for having this conversation. It's a big pleasure for me. Hey, thank you for inviting me. I, I really enjoy our talks together. That's amazing. I, I wanted to start with you telling me a little bit of your journey as a dancer. Where did you start? Who were your teachers? What style did you learn? Um, well, let, let me just um, fire this up and just show you um, who um, I who taught me. Um, so I started off at, um, at um, a junior college when I was 21. And so I was a former football player. Uh, I was trying to do a little bit of bodybuilding with not without, a, not with a lot of success, but I was trying. And then I walked by a college class, uh, a ballet class. And I looked in there and I just saw them jumping around with so much grace. And I, I just said, you know, that looks really interesting. And I, I had seen some ballet on TV, some ballet competitions on TV that just looked really interesting to me, but I, I, I never thought of doing it. But when I saw it in person, it was just so interesting um, and I just decided to sign up for the class. And then um, next thing you know, you know, I was just within three months, I had pretty much transformed my body by stretching every day, maybe five days a week, two hours a day. And uh, you know, I started off with a turnout like this. This was my foot. And then within, within three months, I was like that with my foot. Um, but I had very good, I, I was able to get my splits very good. I could pull my legs up past my head. I was doing split jumps and everything. And uh, within about eight months, I was doing um, solos on a college show. And then so I was able to get a, um, a scholarship at Marin Ballet. Uh, let, me, let me fire it. Where's my... So I was able to get a scholarship over here at Marin Ballet, and uh, this this was the original director of Marin Ballet when I was there. Um, but these two ladies over here, they uh, left the school to make their school later. They went to Marin Dance Theater. So, um, but uh, I still put them on there because they were some of my first teachers. Uh, Shannon Breshnahan over here uh, was taught at, at San Francisco Ballet after she left the Marin Ballet. She taught at San Francisco Ballet for about oh at least a decade. So. I had some very good teachers um, that, that I was fortunate. And of course, we have Miko, Miko Neeson over here. Um, he is the uh, longtime director of Boston Ballet. But before he was a director at Boston Ballet, he was a uh, director at Marin Ballet for uh, a little over a year. So I had the benefit of um, you know, taking class from him. So a very, very capable man. And of course, he brought along um, Svetlana, uh, Athani, <laughs> I can't speak these uh, Russian names. Yeah. Maybe you want to give it a try. But uh, Svetlana, she was the um, ballet mistress at Kirov in Russia. So very, very uh, knowledgeable. Uh, she was uh, unfortunately she passed away. Uh, um, uh, you know, maybe a, about ten years ago. Her daughter is still the uh, owner and director of City Ballet in San Francisco. So mm -hmm. uh, very strong ballet family, and um, she gave me a lot of very good Russian. Um, foundations, especially the port bras and, and the artistry, I think. But um, all of these teachers were, were very important to me, and, and they, um, they taught me very well. And so um, within about two years, this was me after two years of training 
over at Marin Ballet. So converting from a football. I will stop, stop you right here because uh, I think this is something that some of the uh, people watching this podcast or listening to this podcast can take it. You started with 21 years old, which is not young for, for ballet. And you were doing football before. And then you were telling me after some months you got to this. Yeah. This is this is really inspirational. I think people can take it uh, if you really like it, and if you put the work. There are there are many things you can do regardless of your age. Yeah. Flexibility is something can be worked on. Turnout is something can be worked on. So sometimes, yeah. like ballet teachers, it happened to me. It happened to many people that I know. Uh, you are uh, 15, 16, and if you are not perfect, they already tell you you are too late. Yeah, yeah it's not. It's not just, too late. Just wanted to point out. Yeah, it is. It is difficult to get training. Like I said, I was very fortunate to be able to get some training. Um, I didn't get any men's training early on because uh, the schools that I was at were uh, all all girls, but all very very good good ballerinas. So what I worked on was whatever the girls worked on. I tried to do. I, I even trained some point just to get my feet strong, and whatever extension they get, I try to I try to match them. So I was able to um, really do try to match their extension. And this was back in the nineteen nineteen nineties, um, ancient time now. But uh, mm-hmm. back in those days, this, it, was, um, it was not common for the men to have high extension, except for the most elite companies in the world. Now it's much more common, right? Now the, the standards today are much better. Um, but back in the 1990s, you know, the guys always had very low, most of the guys had low legs. But because I only trained with um, very good girls, um, I really try to match, match them. So um, I, uh, before I go on, um, I was able to get accepted into a company about two years later. Um, I didn't join the company. I didn't, I didn't like that particular director um, due to some harassment issues. So um, mm-hmm. then uh, in 2000, I was uh, given a contract at Sacramento Ballet. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I was, um, it was in a kind of a, a change in my life where I was just getting married and I needed money, and I needed needed to raise a family. So I, I took a, a tech job in Silicon Valley instead, um, so it was substantially higher pay. Uh, so unfortunately, I had to kind of give up the the career uh, that was, you know, that I worked hard for. So it was kind of hard for me, and, and I got out of shape, you know, working a, a nine to five job. And then I, I got really out of shape. But then um, I came back. Uh, in 2012, in 2010, I started working out again. I came back and I, I, I got back in shape. I started, I started performing again. And then I had to lose a lot of weight. I had to get, go back to the gym. Um, one of the key things that got me in, um, back to dancing shape was not taking ballet classes, but going to the gym. So that, right. was, that was essential. Like just physically getting strong, like really getting strong on weightlifting. Um, that helped me get my be- metabolic rate up, you know, my strength got up. And one of the side effects, is, the side effects was that it made me a very good partner. So I was able to mm-hmm. lift a uh, very, you know, very, how should I put it? Just uh, taller girls. Um, and also yeah. girls that are in, in, in um, teenage girls who are not very good at uh, being lifted, right? They don't help you. Right. Professional ballerinas are much easier to lift because they do everything right. Their timing is good. They, they jump really well. Um, so when you work with teenagers, you have to be extra strong. So, so going to the gym a lot really helped me not only get in shape as a dancer, but also helped me become a very good partner. So mm-hmm. I've, been, I've been doing a lot of partnering. And so I, it was able, I was able to dance a lot for uh, schools as a guest dancer. And I, I was able to train maybe 100 Hundred, probably a hundred teenage girls on how to how to partner because it's very hard for them to get a a, a partner uh, that can lift them and you know if they can get a guy at all right so yeah that's my background well, so but I mean, more recently you know, I'm 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 50 years old 51 in less than a month so it's it's getting a little bit harder to dance um, so I've been transitioning to teaching right now. And sharing my knowledge, and and uh, so that's why I created created this um, website, and I'm trying to share the knowledge and bring, um, you know, bring the gift of ballet to to the next generation. 
there are so many things I, I would like to dive more in, but uh, I, I don't know how long you will get this conversation to. Anyway, um, so like now you're saying you're transitioning into teaching, but um, what was your motivation for that? Especially after you you quit ballet, then you came back to it, and uh, what was the you know, what was the motivation? What was your feelings after um, after your experience? Well, I mean, I certainly I don't want to stop, right? If I if I can't perform as much as I used to, um, I don't I don't want to leave ballet, right? And and during all the time that I I trained the girls partnering, um, I was already doing a lot of you know, informal teaching when I, when I train the girl to do the pas de deux, right? And I, I have a lot of knowledge. Um, and one of the um, side effects of getting out of shape was that it completely broke everything. Like, so when I quit professionally, everything broke. Uh, I couldn't do anything. Pirouettes was horrible. Double tours, horrible. Everything, nothing worked. And so what I found was that you had to completely rethink. Like be- before I was dancing a lot, everything was instinctive. You know, it's just in the body, right? Your, your, your muscles, everything knows. But when you don't, when you get out of shape, everything breaks. You have to reanalyze everything. And so when I started studying, um, in, around 20, 2008, 2009 is when YouTube was invented, right? And, and then all of a sudden, all these ballets started showing up on, on YouTube. And I could really study the video. And then I realized when I started watching slow motion that everything that I thought I understood about ballet i didn't understand like things that were almost uh you know religious almost like like everybody knows you do it this way and then while i watch the best dancers in the world do it it's like completely opposite of what everyone teaches Mm -hmm. and so things that i were that i was confused about were things that i that didn't feel natural to me all of a sudden i started studying the slow motion video and i changed my technique to the slow motion video and everything became natural. The things that I used to do instinctively, um, well, let me tell you a story. Like um, tour jeté, um, for example, um, if I talk about the tour jeté, everybody teaches batman front, okay? Mm-hmm. Everybody. Everybody teaches this. You have to do batman front, relevé, jump, batman front, right? That's what everybody teaches. What, did the, what does everybody do? Everybody starts Batman side. This is Catherine Morgan. All these teacher, teachers tell you Batman front. And this is really frustrating to me because in my first year of ballet, I was doing, I was doing this in my first mm-hmm. year, just out of instinct. I was doing everything correct. And then they taught me the correct way to do things. Once they taught me the correct way, my tour de tape got, got completely broken for 10 years. I didn't know how to fix it. It didn't feel right. I can kind of do it. But it never felt 100% because I was trying to do Batman front, and which is physically impossible, right? So you look at all these teachers. They, they, they say do Batman front, but they, they themselves do Batman side. And then if you try to do Batman front, you get something crooked like this. So she's, she's kicking upstage, and the yeah. first leg goes this way, and the second leg goes this way. This is completely wrong. So this is what happens when you try to do Batman front, right? So she kicks upstage, and the second leg kicks not the same direction. So if you look at um, the most elite dancers in the world, this is uh, Leonid Serafanov, Batman side, right? Split. This is another wonderful dan- dancer, Young Goy Choi, right? Very, very good. And he, he makes these beautiful positions. And here's Isabella Boy- Boy- Boylston, right? And this is uh, Artemy. Belikov, mm-hmm. right? All Batman side, all Batman, all they make these wonderful positions in the air. So when I started studying these, and I realized that you know, like if I study sl- slow motion, I can all of a sudden my technique just went through the roof. That it just it's everything just started feeling natural because uh, when you when you do it the way it's actually supposed to be done, rather than the way that they teach you, everything becomes simple. And then I, when I start showing dancers, students, how to do this, they go from not being able to do it to being able to do it really well within a matter of minutes. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to say something. I wanted to share some, some thoughts on this. Um, I can see that, uh, especially nowadays, the, 
the level of awareness in 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 the dancers no I, I don't say yet in the teachers but in the dancers is so low and then those dancers end up becoming teachers but instead of uh, during their careers try to understand what how the body works and how things are meant to be done analyzing their own videos or videos from other dancers and understanding what ballet technique is at the end they end up forgetting everything they have done and they look at the book of ballet and they teach what's in that book yeah. and then we end up with that like people teaching something that they don't really understand that didn't work in their bodies before and they, they will not work in the ballet in this uh bodies of this other students and then we end up with the really talented that somehow they can dance by by feeling and then the rest of the of the world that they don't understand why things don't work yeah and so that, for me it's really it's really interesting that to to hear you like you have already that level of awareness being a ballet dancer and then and then it translates to being a teacher because it, well, it's the same and i can see that a lot well well the thing is I've been watching ballet for over a decade and I never realized these things because these things happen too quickly. They, they happen in one tenth of a second. Your eye and your brain cannot possibly see what's going on in, in slow motion. But the computer mm -hmm. can, right? You can play it back. So let me show you on the computer. If I was to show you on the computer how I actually determine this, right? If I show you... Let me find a video. Yeah, like right. it doesn't even go to the, to the front. So if I show you the video, you know, let me slow this down a little bit. Let me make it a little bigger. So I'm using a software called Pot Player. It's an open source free software, uh, P-O-T-P-L-A-Y-E-R, for, for our audience that wants to know this themselves. So I download, downloaded this from his Instagram page. right? So if I play it, I can hit the hit the space button, I can hit F button to advance, I can go backwards, I can go forward, right? This looks nothing like what you see in a textbook, right? Yeah. So now he's, he's in plie, but he's already in second, right? He's definitely in second. Now, over here, now he goes up, he is at the top of the jump, and he makes this beautiful split arabesque line, right? He looks like he's floating. So if I show it to you full speed, right? That's a that's a superb jump, right? So if if every superb elite dancer in the world does this, how can the textbook be right, right? And so when I watch the students do it the way that the textbook teaches it, um, most students don't do a good torch day. If you go into a, a beginning, intermediate, or even some advanced classes, most of the students do not do anything close to this, right? And there's a reason for that. And the reason is because they bought on front the way that they were taught instead of doing it the way it should be done in slow motion, right? So I use this technology. And also, you don't even have to download the video. YouTube, you can, you can pause the video on YouTube. Um, you can hit the period key to advance one frame. You hit the comma key, it'll go back one frame. So you don't even need to download the video. You can just play it on YouTube, hit pause, and then hit the period key to go forward, hit the comma key to go backwards. So what I did with these pictures is I, um, I consolidated them into an easy-to-view picture. Here, let me show this. Right, so I, 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 I put them frame by frame, and I put them together so that it's easy for people to see every single frame, right? Mm -hmm. So then they can see all these pictures together. And I put this on my, on my uh, blog post so that everybody, I show the link, they can click on the link, they can look at the video themselves, they can look at the pictures. And, and even, even after all this, what's frustrating is that some of the old teachers and some of the students still argue with me. They tell you, oh no, I don't, I don't care. You know, you should still teach it the wrong way, even though 
I know that you're right, but you still have to teach it the wrong way. Because if you teach it the wrong way, they'll do it the right way. But that's not true. Because if they were, if that was true, I would see most students would be able to do this. But the truth mm -hmm. is, even most advanced students don't do this well. Right? Why, why do you think is that? Why, why do you think we still have that mentality of keeping the what's written in the book, even if we know it doesn't work? It's 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 frustrating because. Um, it's so, uh, ballet is very old fashioned. Um, ballet is um, a lot of strong traditions, right? It's very hard to break old traditions. And if you try to say something new, you get, you get a lot of hostility. But I think mm -hmm. I, I slowly in the last six months, I've slowly started converting people. I put so much information forward when they look at so all the evidence. And I explain to them, no, you cannot teach it the wrong way and get the right results. And they say, well, but I have, a, I have all these elite students. They do great. And it's like, well, yeah, but that's, that's survivor bias, right? You mm -hmm. have some elite students just because they do it well. Okay, now, okay, grab a room full of intermediate and beginning students. Go teach them your way. See what happens, right? Don't, don't take the students from level three Vaganova Academy in Russia, right? Those are the mm -hmm. best. Those are hand-picked students that are the best students out of a thousand, right? Anybody can do good with those students. But can you take a, a room of local students that are intermediate and, and, and beginning students or, or adults and show them this and get results, right? I bet you they cannot. But I know I can because I, I, uh, I teach kids. I teach teenagers uh, all the way from anywhere from 11 to 18, and I teach adults. And I get the same results with the kids as I get with the adults, right? So when I show them these pictures, they go, okay, so here's a, a re uh, the reason I brought this up is that this is a textbook. This shows you the mm -hmm. textbook way, but I'm, this is a lie. These pictures were not done from an actual tourjete. This is one of the more yeah. famous books, Classical Ballet Technique. Um, and this, this taught a generation of teachers the wrong way to do things. Um, this this is a pose. This dancer is not doing a tour today. This dancer is just doing a single uh, devong jump. She's not doing a tour today. She did not suddenly switch to this from here to there and then to there. That this is physically impossible to do it this way, right? If you if you try to do this, there's no way you could do this. So they took multiple pictures doing different jumps, different static poses, like this position. This is impossible. Nobody does this. Mm -hmm. There's no motion blur. <laughs> These are these were done in the 1980s. Uh, of course, this is a beautiful dancer. This is a good photographer, but this is not a real tour jeté. But they make yeah. it sound, they make it look like a tour jeté. And so it's very frustrating to me because all the textbooks are wrong. And, it, and, uh, and, and people say, well, why do you argue with people? Why do you have to say people are wrong? The reason I have to do it is because when I teach it the right way, nobody believes me. I go to the class, the, the, the kids, they think I'm crazy. Right, so I have to show them these pictures and prove it. I have to show them. My, I have to open my laptop. I have to open my phone. I have to show them. Okay, these are the best dancers in the world doing this, and then they will believe me, and then they'll do it. So every time when you try to teach things the right way, um, even the students don't believe you. Why would they believe me? Uh, there's they've they've had ten teachers that tell them to do it this way. Well, why should they yeah. believe me? Right, there's no reason that they would believe me. So true. I, I have one teacher that uh, the other day he, he told me, you know, Sergio, like everyone can learn how to dance. Everyone can learn technique, but uh, not everyone can teach that. Not everyone can teach the right approach and the right technique and the right exercises. Most, most of the teachers nowadays, they just create classes that are a mix of exercise from here, from there, and it just doesn't work because they don't even understand why the exercises are done a certain way. They just open the book and they and they say, this is how you should be doing it. But there is no research. There is no, there is no understanding. And it, it is really sad. Right. Well, what I do with students is uh, I, I film them, right? I, I, sometimes they come in through Zoom and I record it for them. And I'll, I'll, I'll take a picture of it and I'll, I'll draw a line through the body. And all of a sudden you show them the line through the body that they're doing something wrong. And then they immediately understand. Right? Everyone, when they see themselves in a the picture, they say, oh, here's how you do it. Here's the elite dancer. Here's you. What's the difference? Immediately they get it. 
something sometimes I'll tell someone um, ten times. I'll tell them uh, I'll tell them, tell them for six months. You can explain something for six months; they'll never get it. I show them the picture one time, and they get it. I mean, they instantly get it, right? And so that's something I think um, that I would like to see in the ballet world change is that um, it's very old fashioned. It's very tradition. I mean, we have beautiful traditions. I mean, we want to keep those beautiful traditions, but it doesn't mean we have to be stuck with with the yeah. old technology, right? We can adopt new technologies, right? Uh, well, here, let me show you another example of of a problem that people, let me show the desktop. So double tour, for example, mm -hmm. this one frustrated, frustrates me a lot. And so this, this particular teacher here from the rock school uh, says, don't cheat. He says you should you should face front from a proper fifth position, right? Everybody teaches that, right? He's telling the right mm -hmm. thing. He's he's showing this is a cheat. This is wrong, right? Now here's the problem. When the boys take off like this, this is the boys taking off facing front. This is how they land. They land with their back to the audience. Okay. So if mm -hmm. I show you, this boy took off in the front, and he landed like this with his back to the audience, right? This is not good, right? Um, actually, sorry, let me change the way I... Yeah. Okay, so if I showed you... Um, so what I had to do with a boy, I, told, I explained this to them, and they don't believe me. But then I showed them what... Here's what happens. This is uh, Joseph Gotti. One of the mm -hmm. one, really, really good dancer, right? Elite level dancer, right? I showed him this is the preparation. He twisted his hips and he pre rotated exactly what the teacher says not to do. And I, I, I looked at many elite dancers, I looked at everybody, you included. Uh, um, I looked at all the elite dancers. This is what they always do, right? This is they do this, and, and guess what? They all land facing front, okay? So if you don't cheat the beginning, you'll cheat the end. So if you take off in the facing front, you're going to land with your back to the audience. And then you have to hop and, and do this awkward hop. Now, there are, a few, there are a few phenomenal jumpers that can take off from the front and land double, full double tour. But those people, they can do triple mm -hmm. tour if they cheat. Right? They can do a cheat yeah. at triple tour or they can do a full double tour. But most people cannot do this. And so what I try to explain to people is that you know, if I had a student that was squatting 100 pounds in the gym and he's just finished learning how to squat 100 pounds, am I going to go tell him? It's like, okay, hey, Joe, uh, you're doing 100 pounds really good. Let me, um, let me make you squat 200 pounds. What's going to happen to him? Is he, I'm going to kill him, right? Mm -hmm. So to, to ask a student to go from a double tour to a, to, sorry, a single tour to a double tour is just like asking them to go squat 100 pounds and jump up to 200 pounds. It makes no sense. You cannot tell the student that I expect you to do a full double, right? Now, maybe once in a while you get a student, student that's phenomenally talented and they do double. All right, wonderful. Go do it. Don't, don't cheat, right? If you can do it, don't cheat. But if you do it 10 times and every time you land with your back to the audience and you have to hop around, why do you do that? Well, what, what is the benefit? Of, what, is, what, what is the benefit? And all you're going to do is make them feel um, inadequate. They're going to feel insecure. They're gonna they're gonna have anxiety, right? Now they're gonna be scared of double tour because double tour, um, we all know it's very scary. You're going in the air, you're you're spinning. You don't know if you come down on an ankle and break a break a an ankle, right? Mm -hmm. So it's hard enough, it's scary enough. And so when I showed a student, I told him for three months, do this, do this. He'd never listen. And I show him this, I show him the video of Joseph Gotti doing a beautiful double tour, and then Five minutes instantly, he's doing it, and then now he he's sticking the landing, and he looks just he looks just like that, right? So this is an example of of why I insist on using um, technology because um, they don't believe you, right? You can you can tell them for a year that they do something wrong, and and they will never believe you because they don't want to believe you.
you know, one, if, if I can keep the compa comparison between the bodybuilding world, let's say, and ballet world, uh, for me, it's still like really surprising that when you are working to get your PR, or for example, you are working to get a 200 pound uh, squat, there is a certain um, a certain period, like let's say three, four weeks, where you have to train, and that in these weeks there are phases where you will increase the weight a lot, but there are other phases where you will decrease the weight so you can rebuild. And they, they, there's a full program, uh, and every day has a purpose in order for you to get there. But in ballet, this is somehow like, well, you try you try yourself however you can. Uh, you need to work. And then I will just judge the final result. And if you don't make it, then you're not good enough. Instead of taking the student and bring the student day by day to the end goal. Yeah. And it happens a lot also in ballet companies. Oh, you're a professional. You should be able, like there's always this phrase, yeah. you should be, you, you should be able to do this and that. And what about if I didn't learn that before, you know, like right. you need to take that time to teach the, stu the student or the professional dancer how to get from point A to point B. It's the same with partnering. I, I see like people get thrown on stage and it's like, yeah, you need to learn how to do partnering. I don't know, do it in your free time uh, or what, but you know, like, but how, what are the foundations of partnering? Do you know right. where the weight of the girl is? Do you even understand what does it mean? Well, that's partnering uh, is another one of those things where I thought I understood things until I started studying slow motion. The things mm -hmm. that were, that I was struggling with, I had to go study, go back and study the slow motion and say, oh, I did that wrong. And I change it to the way that the guy that uh, uh, the, the elite dancer in the world does it, and all of a sudden everything's easy, right? So I know, like, like I I could do it with brute force because I'm really strong, right? But what happens that over the years is that um, as I get older, I can't do the brute force as much anymore. And then sometimes you get someone that mm -hmm. um, you get a girl that uh, is a little taller, and the brute force method doesn't work. Right. And then so as I got older mm -hmm. and I started getting shoulder injuries, um, I, I'm OK now. But when I when I was getting shoulder injuries, um, it was actually a good thing for me because it forced me to learn the technique. Whereas before I was just saying, OK, I'm really strong. I'm just going to muscle her up. Right. And mm -hmm. then when I had a shoulder injury for a, for a good year, I had to learn. I had to relearn everything to do things the, the efficient way. Right. And yeah. one of the other problems is that. Uh, I train a lot of girls, um, not for, not necessarily for, for, for performance. They, um, I get them ready for the, the guest artist that's going to come in the last week. Right. So what happens is that I train these girls, everything works by brute force. And then when the other guy comes in, he can't do it by brute force. The girl's not ready for it. I haven't taught her mm -hmm. how to do things to make it easier on the guy. Right. So, so as time went on, I just said, Okay, you cannot just use brute force. You need to learn how to do it, the finesse, as if you were weaker, right? right? So as if I'm injured, as if I'm weaker, how would I do this? So once I learned that, I was able to teach um, the boys how to... So, uh, for example, the shoulder sit. It's very, very hard for the boys to learn, right? That's something... Um, my son, when he was 16, 17, he was practicing. He never got it. And then last year, when he was um, guesting for a snow snow and a nutcracker um i developed different techniques for teaching how to do it efficiently and so finally i was able to get my son he's he's you know my height but he's very skinny he's very weak because he's still not fully developed yet mm -hmm. right so i really had to learn how to teach it to, to uh, everybody not just assuming that they can you know uh, okay you have to be able to deadlift 300 pounds to be able to do this no no that doesn't work you have to be able to teach it to a 15 or 16 year old boy who is um, only 135 pounds himself. He's going to be a skinny stick. How do you how do you explain it to him so that he can do it? Right. So, and the only way mm -hmm. I could do that was by watching slow motion and and really studying the pictures and figuring out okay, where's the center of mass? Where do you grip her? What's the best way to do it? Right. So everything exactly. that I've done now is it's like you have to study the video. You have to study the slow motion. You have to freeze it, pause it, you know, draw some lines, figure out, you know, where's, where's the body placed? Where's the head placed? Everything has to be a matter of physics and mathematics. Yeah. I, I also found him in, in my years as a professional. I, I don't know what you think about this, yeah, but um, most of the times when there is a new couple happening or this, this new girl that is jumping in the main role for the first time, uh, when she dances with the boy, she's like waiting for the boy. 
Yeah. And unfortunately, most of the boys, they are like, you have to wait for me. But I always tell the girls like, you should dance like you are alone. And it's the work of the boy to adapt to your dynamics. Because if you, we don't, if we don't do that, it will just mean I'm doing everything with brute force. But I want to use your energy to lift you, to move you around, to turn. And, and so then you will feel comfortable because you are doing, you're dancing like if you are alone, you don't have to adapt. You don't have to dance in two different ways in one performance. Yeah. And that's something that also teachers don't, don't teach. They just say to the girl, do it this way so he can partner you. Or they say to the boy, like, you just need to muscle up this leap. But that's just not the way it yeah. should be. You should be able to use yeah, the usually, power of the I, I do something very similar. I, I tell the girl, you do, you do it to your timing and let me adapt to you. Right? But, but, but you make sure you do it the same way every time. Don't change, don't, don't change, exactly, it, yeah, don't yeah. change your timing. Uh, the only time I will change it is if they are, um, it's very dangerous to partner teenage because sometimes they will come at you and kick you. Right? So then mm. you have to make them change it. Right? So I, I tell them, for example, if I have to catch them in the tour jeté, I tell them, you run straight that way. Don't look at me because I'm afraid if they look at me, they come and kick me. And I've been kicked mm -hmm. um, pretty hard with the point shoes to the point where I'm bleeding. Right? So, I, oh. yeah, so it's, it, it can get bad. Right? So, generally speaking, I let them do their own thing, but um, I do have to teach them how to do a lot of things. For example, the tour jeté. They don't know how to do the tour jeté right. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't kick, they kick the second leg out. They don't kick it straight. And then you cannot catch them. Right? So, Mm -hmm. I have, this is one of the things I have to show them. I have to say, okay, you cannot butt on front. You have to butt on side. And then they look at me like, okay, I, wait, why are you telling me to do this wrong? And then I have to show them the video. Like, okay, no, it's butt on side. And then I can get it, right? Um, sometimes a soda shot. They don't know how to do the soda shot, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, they think I have to brush the foot on the floor. And then I show them the slow motion. It's like, no, no, you don't do, you don't do that. Um, you, you take off and you have to come in, you have to develop the foot through. And I have to show them the pictures. I, I, let, me, let me bring that picture up so we don't. I see, I have pictures of everything. Okay, so this is a picture of. Right. Photoshop. And one thing that they t tell you, you have to take off on the turnout foot. Does that foot look turned out? <laughs> this is this is Ina Selenko. This is yeah. this is Ina Selenko. This is not some nobody. Here's another ballerina. She does a beautiful jump. Right? This is Ina Selenko. This is a phenomenal jump. This is uh, uh I'm sorry, what's her name? She dances Paris Opera Ballet. Um, right. Does that look turned out to you? Mm -hmm. none, none of these are turned out and so i show them these pictures they don't i show them these pictures this is the um this is slow motion and the takeoff look at that she never she never mm -hmm. brushes the floor I see girls, they brush the floor. And then this is a big problem because if you're partnering her, they kick your toe when you're trying to pick them up. I had my toe almost broken because they, she tries to brush the foot and kick her toe into my pinky toe when I'm trying to get her up. Mm -hmm. And I have to explain to them that, no, you, you, you do it like this, right? Her foot passes through the knee, right? And so when I explain this to people and I show them these pictures, they go, oh, now I get it. Then they, then they do it the right way. And then, then, then they can get a beautiful soda shot, right? And then, of course, the, the side effect is I don't get kicked. <laughs> that's, the number, that's the number one reason I want to make, make them fix that because it hurts a lot to get kicked in the toe with a point shoe. I would like to get into one specific uh, topic that you that you you worked on, which is the heels down when, when you jump, because I did a video about it and I think uh, we can explain it better right now. So uh, can you, can you tell us like what, what was your research? Why, why did you start to think about this way to, to jump? Well, um, you had the exact same experience as me, right? You, you started 
everyone tells you to do your put your heel down. I thought it was, of course, you would never not put your heel down, right? Everyone told you that's so dangerous. And mm-hmm. then I tried, I kept pushing my heel down until I actually injured the front of my ankle. So I jammed the front of my ankle, uh, and it's, it's called anterior, anterior, uh, ankle impingement. Okay. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I started studying it and I said, you know, why am I injuring my ankle? Why does it hurt so much? And I realized that, that I, I simply don't have that range of motion to be able to put my heel down when I want to, when I want to do a deeper plie. So. I started studying videos and I realized like, why is everybody jumping without the heel? This is Angel Corella, Vadim, mm-hmm. this is Osio Gunio, Andre Batloff. These are not amateurs. These are some of the best dancers in the world. <laughs> heel up, heel up, heel up, heel up. Daniel, Daniel Simkin, okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Maria, Maria Kareva, uh, or Horeva, I think is how she says it. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's another example. This is Ivan Putrov. Um, they, they, they like to do the glissades on the ball of the foot. And it looks beautiful. This, I, I see this version. They look like they're floating. It looks like an impossible mm-hmm. jump, right? And then it's like, wait a minute, that actually feels good. Uh, okay, so here's Nureyev. He's an exception. He does like to put his heel down, but he's doing something different. He, he's, um, he's in a separate, he's, he's not in fifth position. So that makes it easier to put the heel down. Then I started looking at, um, okay, well, how do, how do uh, runners do it? This is um, Usain Bolt. Okay. This is the fastest man in the world. He never put his heel down. The fastest man in the world. I started studying, okay, how do you do a world, you know, how do you do the highest jump in the world? Okay, the highest jump in the world uses heel up. This is the highest vertical jump that this man can do. And to me, it's like, this is totally natural. This is how basketball, basketball players jump. And then I did something even more um, interesting. I, I, I have an engineering background, okay? So I, I did the actual calculation. I drew out the structural load analysis. So I drew mm-hmm. out the bones, I drew out the, the muscles, I drew out the tendon. I did the cal- calculation. If you put your heel down and if you put 300 pounds of force in the ground, and of course we we dancers do put 300 pounds of force when they jump. Like for a man, it's actually more. A man can put down 400 pounds when they jump. But I just use mm-hmm. this as an example. Okay, 300 pounds uh, on the down on the down force into the floor, and that's on one foot. That puts about 1,500 pounds of load on the Achilles tendon. 1,500 pounds. So 300 pounds here translates to 1,500 pounds of cable tension here, okay? If you lift your heel up, this is with the same deep plie depth. This is the hip joint. You only do 1,000 pounds. So go from 1,534 pounds down to 1,002 pounds. Mm -hmm. And when I started jumping like this, it felt better. I, I, I got no more. I didn't have inflamed Achilles tendon. I didn't have inflamed soleus. I didn't jam the front of my ankle anymore. And I jumped higher, right? It, it felt natural. To me, it was, it was like, okay, now I'm back to my natural instinct, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and I see all these uh, you know, elite dancers jumping without their heel down, and, I, and then I tried it myself, and then I said, oh, this feels really good. And I, I had ankle pain. I had Achilles pain. I had ankle pain. I had um, since most of my 20s, most of my 30s. When I was 20 years old, 30 years old, I had a lot of ankle pain and Achilles pain. I adopted this method when I was 39 years old, right? I I had a lifetime of pain. All of a sudden I I have no more pain. I'm I'm almost 40 years old right now. I'm 50 years old. I can, I still jump like this. I have zero pain now and I can still demonstrate double tour at age 50, right? So I know it's not a mistake. It's not just something I I didn't just get lucky when I figured this out. Mm -hmm. This is the actual science. Now, let me show you. This is what dance science shows. This is her picture. Where's the math? This is not even drawn right. This is this is in the scientific journal at one of the uh, one of the dance magazine journals for science. Okay, this is uh, this is her drawing. This is an unplugged, unpublished master's thesis. 
There is no force calculation. There's no correct drawing. There's no structural analysis. They said, okay, here's the picture. You should put your heel down. And then and they say, well, but, but she, she has a college degree in, 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 um, in dance and uh, physical therapy. Well, what does that mean? You, you, yeah. didn't, you didn't do any physics. You didn't do any structural load analysis. You never took those classes. Right? Those, those majors don't take any kind of engineering structural load analysis. They don't take the physics. Yeah. They don't take the math. They don't know how to do the math. So they just tell you, okay, well, here's, here's my picture. Um, this is from, um, what was it? Yeah, this is, this is from this article over here. And not loading. Yeah, so this is from the International Association for Dance Medicine and Science. Right? Mm -hmm. This is all they did. They show you a picture uh, with some randomly drawn lines that don't represent an actual force. They don't show the bone structure. They don't show the tendon structure. I, I did the actual work, and mm -hmm. they, wouldn't, they didn't want to publish this. <laughs> because, because it's against, yeah, it's against what everyone it, It's against what everyone says. But you guys, you guys have not done any work to validate your argument, right? And I show this, and it's still I get a, I get a lot of pushback because it's it, it it's so different. It, it violates what everyone's been taught. Everyone says you have to put your foot your, your heel down if you want to jump higher. If you want to uh, don't tear your um, Achilles tendon, you don't want to get injured. You have to put your heel down, and it's just the opposite. It's not even wrong. It's not even a different style. It's just wrong, right? Yeah. So. So me, for me, I, I have a personal history of ankle injury. I know I saw your blog. I, I saw your video blog. You had a similar experience. Yeah, you tried so hard. I had a teacher telling me, oh, you have to put your heel down um, because that's what the book says. And I said, well, do you, you don't put your heel down. Like, yeah, well, it, it hurts when I put my heel down. Well, yeah, me too. It hurts when I put my heel down. So why, why are you teaching me to put my heels down if it hurts you? You don't put your heel down. Mm -hmm. You jump really well. I'll let me be wrong like you. Right? But it's not actually exactly. wrong, right? So you know, how I think that is yeah. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, because I think the what what everyone mistakes is um, they 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 have two different things that are colliding at the same time, and so if you don't have a fluid plie, let's say if your plie is not uh, soft and it's not um, how you say like. If it doesn't allow you to bounce when you jump, then everyone thinks it's because your heel is up. If you if you have like a stuck plié, everyone says it's because of that. But it's not. Uh, you, I have this the, one of my best friends. He's Japanese, and one summer he went to Japan. And in Japan, they have incredible healthcare and the, the doctors, and especially for ballet, like so many there's so many physiotherapists that they, they have a, they have done a lot of research. And there's some information they have, and we don't have that in Europe, or I don't know in America how it is. Anyway, he was telling me I did this uh, this study. Like uh, they, they were they were telling me about my mechanics on how I dance, and they were telling me that I shouldn't be putting my hips down. Like my Achilles size or my Achilles length is a certain, and uh, for my body, it will work better if I don't push the hips down because, like, first of all, no one does that in in, in other sports, as you were saying. And second of all, like my best plie and my best jump comes when I don't put my heels down. Right. Well, but the thing, he here's like, the thing. But if, of course, I can I cannot tell this to everyone because but, but, but here's the no thing. one will believe me. Most dancers, when they are at the elite level, don't put their heels down. When you are mm -hmm. jumping with good ballon, like the, the Bornadil style dancers, the, the Netherlands, uh, the Bornadil dancers, mm -hmm. they have some of the best petit allegro, right? They have some of the best ballon in the world. They don't put their heel down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the reason I brought this picture up is that um, this was me doing pas de esclave. This is the one mm -hmm. where you have to do um, uh, envelope pas de chat, land grand plie from maximum height and jump si song out of, the, uh, out of that. For that jump, it's impossible to put the heel down because you're doing a grand plie. You're landing in grand mm -hmm. plie. 
And so when I learned that jump, this was, this was the same time I realized that it, felt, it feels really good to jump with the heels up. So when I started doing Pottis Glove, when I started doing all these advanced jumps, it's impossible to put your heel down. Like if you want to do mm-hmm. really beautiful jumping, you cannot put your heel down. Okay. If you, um, if you look at um, the four little swans, even it's not even the biggest jumps. If you look at the, let me show you a picture of the four little swans over here. Okay, so this is the four little swans. One of the things I realize is that we don't use fifth position for jumping. What position is that called? In the textbook. When, when is this ever taught? It doesn't taught? exist. Huh? It, it doesn't exist. It does, well, it does exist because it's, it, the, the dancers use it. Mm-hmm. All Most dancers use the overcross fifth. I, I like to call it the seventh position because, I mean, sixth position is this. So this is mm-hmm. uh, fifth. This, I call that seventh position. Now, that's just my, the name that I gave it, just, to, just for simplification, right? So when you go to seventh position like this, you cannot put your heel down. So when mm-hmm. you, do, and I realized that this is a much better position to do double tour. It's a much better position to do cease, uh, entre chicot. So when the, the little swans are doing their rapid entre chicots, or Giselle, like Giselle, she has that whole section where she does a lot of beats. They don't put the heel down because it's more efficient. It hurts less. You jump better. Um, and when you overcross, it makes the beat look better because you, you're, you're, you're not just doing this little, little dinky little you know, vibration. You want the mm-hmm. huge crossing. So this huge crossing aesthetically makes it much better. Yeah. So this position is never taught, but I teach it. I, I teach it. I call it seventh position. I don't care if it's not in the textbook. I teach this because you have to use it. If you want to do Ancha Shikat, you want to really master beats, okay, you have to do this. It just doesn't work from a flat fifth position. It's, it's just like uh, it, it, your, your, the balls of your foot are placed in the wrong position in fifth. It's not, it's not a good jumping position. That's why all the double tours, they, they, they overlap the heel and they, they go beyond fifth position. Right, so it's not just giant jumps that benefit from um, heel up, but it's also very small and medium-sized jumps. So medium, small, big jumps. If you're jumping really well, you want the ball under your center of gravity, and the only way you can do that is by lifting the heel. If you put the heel down, your ball, the the foot is in the wrong place, and it's not under the center of gravity. So when you do you know, when, if I go back to my article, um, the, the reason I, I have this picture here is even for a one foot ballonne or one foot assemblé, you want to cross this standing foot beyond where your normal fifth position you want. So normally at the mm-hmm. fifth position, the toe would be here. You want to cross mm-hmm. this one under and past the center of gravity to be able to do a really good ballonne or, or, or assemblé. So if you really want to point your feet and you want to jump really high, this is how you do it. Right? And there's, and it's impossible to put your if you overcross the fifth, you cannot put the heel down. It's even more difficult. Fifth is already hard enough. It's interesting. Right? So but seventh position is even harder. Don't try it at the bar, you know, put 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 your toes together. Don't come down to fifth. It's much much harder mm-hmm. to put the heel down. But it, it feels so good to jump from seventh. It's so natural. Like sea songs, um, entre chicot, entre chassis, double tour, none of them work well from fifth. They work better from seventh position. So and this is kind of a one foot seventh position, All right? So this is this is um. Here's Maria. <laughs> what what position? What? Let's see. Sorry. What position is that? Yeah. The, what 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 position is that called? Is that is that correct position in the textbook? Right? No, of course not. But is that correct dancing? Yes. Right? Yeah. These are the best dancers in the world. They all do this because it makes sense. And, and it never, it was frustrating because when I see these elite dancers doing these beautiful jumps, I'm like, how come I can't do that? 
Mm-hmm. And then when I started watching the video, I, oh, I realized, oh, you're not doing the same position that I'm doing. And then when mm-hmm. I start doing these overcrossed seventh positions, then everything becomes magical. My jumps become, you know, my jumps start looking like they belong on, on stage, right? Mm-hmm. So these are all things that are never taught. And I, I look at these things and I think the textbook for ballet needs to be updated so that it reflects what we actually do rather than what we think we do. So that's, that's kind of where I, the, the reason I do this blog is because I want to be able to publish information that I want to share with the world. And because normally if I just tell people this without showing them, showing them the video and the pictures, they think I'm crazy. Oh yeah. Right. You, you, you've never heard, nobody heard of these, these positions, but when I show you the picture, nobody can deny it. And I'm not just picking a bunch of losers. N- none of these people are losers. These are the best dancers in the world. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, saying, I, I, no, I saw no some one. of your videos. You, you also do double tour. You, you do double tour the same way. You, you do it from yeah. the, the pivot hips and the, uh, you put your heel over your foot and you go into seventh position. But still, I, uh, one, one of the things I'm fighting now, I, I, I realized that, well, I started to do bar, but uh, without touching the bar, like basically centered from the bar. Because I realized that once I touch the bar, my whole weight uh, changes, and then I'm not able to, to do a proper plie. So the plie that I'm doing in the bar is not the same that I'm doing in the center. And so I'm trying to change the way my body works by by doing that, by by doing center from the bar. And so... Uh, I think I, 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 I do the same things because I, me doing YouTube for already like three years, I film myself a lot mm-hmm. and I analyze myself a lot, uh, as, like, like you're saying, but uh, I realized that I need to start using my own body weight in a better way. So then the position that I'm doing after will make sense in my body. So I think like I'm fighting with different problems than, than what other people will, will do, but uh, like definitely like uh, I, like I, I, I really don't care about the. When I see the dancers dancing on a stage, when I see live performances, uh, it's all about how they use their bodies, how 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 they are able to to make the illusion of a jump, how how of course how clean they look, but the cleanliness doesn't come from his textbook. It's, it comes from how he's using his muscles, uh, yeah. and like. I, I will always say, like, if you see the male ballet dancer, let's say, because we use tights, not really, everything is visible. All the great dancers have a similar muscle uh, construction, let's say. The, the way their the muscles are worked, they look similar, even if they have different shapes. But it's about the length of the muscle and it's about the, the, the way they work in their feet, the way they plie, the way they throw the legs in the air. They, they, they all they all have uh, something similar in that sense yeah and so the, the, that is what it comes the, the the good dancing and the cleanliness not not from they are doing everything perfect but about how it's about the process how they dance yeah but and i, I I'm, I'm more interested in that at the moment. i i was always when i watched the you know much better dancers than myself do done something beautiful it, before I had access to the technology, it was frustrating because, you, you know, I look at them and I was like, oh, I wish I could do that. How did they do mm-hmm. that? that? Now you, with the technology, I can just, okay, I'm just going to freeze them and I'm going to study the hell out of them. I'm going to figure out, okay, what are mm-hmm. you doing? What am I doing? What are you doing? Why is it different? Why are you doing it better? And then, then, then you compare them side by side and you say, oh, I'm doing this different. Then I change myself to match them. Then all of a sudden I'm doing the same thing that they're doing. And that makes me very mm-hmm. happy, right? I, I'm trying to get better and I'm, I'm, I'm learning new things. Even at age 50, I'm still learning new things. Like um, the other time I saw your, 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 you, have, you made a really good uh, double soda Basque video, mm. okay? You, you did a really good double soda Basque video and I looked at it and I had, I had already studied soda Basque, but I was looking at it from the side angle. You, you showed one where you showed it where you were coming at the camera. And I, re- mm-hmm. I, I recognized that you were doing a little bit of a rendez jump with a foot. And then even you didn't realize that. You thought you were just going straight. When I, I looked mm-hmm. at it, it's like, oh, no, 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 you're doing a rendez jump. 
I thought, is that a mistake? No, it can't be a mistake. You're doing it really good, so it cannot be a mistake. And then I started studying other dancers. I started looking at all the Soderbosk. The foot, instead of doing a straight brush, you're, you're actually doing an a, a inside rondejon. Like maybe maybe not a really wide one, but but it's still a rondejon. And so when I, mm -hmm. I changed to that method, all of a sudden my, my Soderbosk is better. So just that one little change, uh, I, I, I was doing it okay, but it wasn't, wasn't completely natural. But when I mm -hmm. adopt all the little things that, that people who do it better than me do, all of a sudden I'm doing it better too. Yeah. Right? But, and th there's no way to see that on the, the textbook. I, I learned how to do it the way that the textbook teaches it. Uh, and unfortunately, the textbook is wrong. It, mm -hmm. it, the, the way that it teaches you how to do it, it, it only works for a single Sotobosk, not a double Sotobosk. So I, I had to spend, a, I, had to, I had to look at the video, okay? What am I doing? What are the people, what are the elite dancers doing? What am I doing different? Okay, uh, oh, I, oh, that's what I'm doing different? Let me change to what they're doing. And all of a sudden, I'm doing the same thing. Again, this is something I think that everyone should take away from this video, regardless of any other information, is the level of awareness. It has to be raised. Uh, this, yeah. is the first, this is the first step for everything. Uh, well, I, I, I listen to you and I'm like, wow, like uh, if, if the dancers uh, everywhere in the world had 50% of your awareness, like, uh, it, it would be very different. The outcome of every performance, it would be really different. Right. And of course, well, when you're doing, when you're doing, yeah. I, I wish I had access, you know, I wish I had a time machine. I could send all this information back to me when I was 20, mm -hmm. 21, right? I would have learned to me, uh, if I had all this knowledge, I, I would have learned twice as fast. You know, I wouldn't have had to sure. make all the mistakes. I wouldn't have to injure myself. I wouldn't have to, you know, do the trial and error. Why do the trial and error, right? This, what, uh, what the video analysis allows you to do is you can skip all the trials and error, right? In the old days, you just had to do it a thousand times. You had to do it ten thousand times. You, through trial and error, you just keep on doing it until you get it right. And 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 it, that's kind of like throwing random attempts, right? Well, what I'm what I'm seeing now is that you can you can instead of doing ten thousand practices, you can cut that down to a few hundred. If you if you study the video of how the elite dancers do it, and then you film yourself, and then you study yourself you can cut the number of repetitions that you have to do. You can cut the time down, you can cut the injury risk down, and, and you can learn it better in a much shorter time. Right? Because, because it's so easy to see what you're doing wrong when you look at video. Yes. I mean, this is something I, I've been doing for, for many years exactly because of that. I started to feel myself and, yeah. and uh, it, it humbles me down, first of all. And that's something I, I like. It's, it's great. I see my videos and I'm like, okay, this is how I look. This is uh, it's, this it's is very, reality. It's, I need to work on this and that. It's one of the most scariest things in the world for a ballet dancer is to look at themselves in video, right? Everybody that I talk to is like, I, I know professional ballet dancers that never ever watch their own performance. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, maybe you know people like that too. And and I know yeah. I know exactly how they feel. I mean, when I see myself, it's like, oh my god, oh. Oh, that's terrible, right? We, we all have the same feeling, but, it, but it's a bitter pill that you have to take. If you want to improve, you, you, you watch yourself, you make the mistakes. Okay, all right, that's wrong, that's wrong, okay. Um, and, but, but the thing is, if you look at other dancers, you realize some of those mistakes are not actually mistakes, right? Not yeah. everybody's, per when you look at yourself in slow motion or freeze frame, um, it does not look like the textbook. Nobody, nobody looks like, Barishnikov doesn't look like the textbook. Nobody does. Nobody's perfect. And so if, you, if you've seen a lot of freeze frames like I have, you begin to realize you have a realistic expe expectation of what something should look like. So you're a little bit more forgiving of yourself. So when you see yourself not looking like the textbook, you know, okay, that's normal. Or sometimes, sometimes maybe it's not normal. Maybe, maybe you're doing it worse than other people. But then that's an easy... Mm -hmm. that's an easy Thing to address because once you identify the problem you can fix it right because if you don't even know you have a problem then you're never going to fix it yeah it, it amazes me because 
if I if I made the comparison with a business, like we we are the product, and you are selling that product to the audience uh, with the performance and with your dancing. If you never never ever watch your own product, it's like for example, you you made a website. You are not making any sales and then you never review what you are doing and you say like, I don't understand why yeah. I'm not selling anything. Maybe, maybe look at your website. Maybe look at your product. What are you doing? So it's the same. Look at your dancing, look at your performance. Maybe it happened to me also many times that I thought I was acting something that I was expressing something with my face and my dancing. And then I would watch the video and I'm like, ah, okay. Now I understand why I'm making all these corrections because I'm not doing it. One thing is what we feel and another thing is what we look like. So it's, it's also really important to see that mm -hmm. by yourself. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's 10 times worse in the mirror. I, I, I know a lot of students that don't even look, look in the mirror. Right? They make mm -hmm. horrendous mistakes. They're standing six feet from the mirror. They don't, look, they don't look at their feet. It's in the wrong place. So mm -hmm. video is even worse than the mirror. right? Because you, you can put full attention... To look at the video and you can also slow it down and you can freeze it so uh, it, it's one of the most jarring experiences for most dancers to see themselves dance uh because they don't you don't look like what you think you look like none of us do right and so it's it's very humbling like you said um but it's it's something that can really you know speed up your improvement you know, yeah yeah but I, I've yeah. seen I, I, some of my students, they, they were doing um, pirouettes with the, the heel, like only one inch off the floor, or they're doing um, turned in, right? And you show them the video, then they, then they start changing it. Then they say, oh, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. right? If you just tell them, they don't believe you. They don't, want, they don't really yeah. want to believe you, right? But if you show them yeah, the video. I think video, it's more that. I think it's a, they, don't, they don't want to believe that that's the reality. It's, yeah. we are always and, and it's not escape. just them. I, I, I'm the same way. Everybody's the same way. No, none of us yeah. want to believe that we're that awful. Right? When you see the picture, then it's, then, it's, then it's reality hits you. Right? So that's why a lot of dancers uh, refuse to watch their own, own performances. So that's, that's yeah. kind of unfortunate, I think. Um, I want to move on to one, one, one more question, and uh, it is: uh, What is ballet heading, or what do you, what is your opinion on that? Where do you think that ballet is heading? What will be ballet in some years? I've seen that in the last uh, uh, 10, 15 years, things have changed like dramatically, and I don't know. I I, I spoke about this in some of my videos that I feel like uh, we are really disconnected to what ballet used to be with the way we, we tell stories and how everything now has become really, because all of this that we are talking right now is really important and it's really nice, but we cannot forget that technique is not the final product. Technique is the words we use to tell a story. And I, I wanted to know your opinion on that. I think um, ballet has, the dance world in general, not just ballet, um, has really gone up a lot in the last 10 years 10 maybe 15 years and i think um the tv show so you think you can dance has a lot to do with that right that introduced mm -hmm. a lot of people to dance that never would have seen dance and i know people that started dancing because of that tv show so media is extremely important we, we cannot just be so old-fashioned that oh you have to go to the theater to see dance we, we can we have to get mm -hmm. out of that mindset Right now, it's even more extreme with uh, social media, with Instagram, with YouTube. I think it's very important that ballet dancers adopt the new medium format, the, the new media, right? So someone like Sergei, Sergei Pulinin, he became very famous with that, that, that Take Me to Church video on YouTube, right? Just that one video made him famous. Just that one video. And... That one video, I, I know professional dancers that said, I started dancing because I saw that YouTube video. I know, mm -hmm. many, I know many guys that said, that one video inspired me to dance. Right? So I think there's not enough of that. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of dancers that started coming out on YouTube uh, back in the late 2000, 2000s, like 2008, 2009. They started going viral on YouTube. 
And they became very famous because they put their video on YouTube. If they didn't put their video on YouTube, nobody would know who these people are. Right? It, it, it shouldn't just, I, I think that ballet should not just be for rich people. It should not just be for people that can afford tickets to go to the opera house. Right? Most, mm-hmm. people, can, most people will never be able to buy a ticket to see, to see the best art in the world. Right. So I think we, as a community, we really need to extend our use of social media. And I think the dancers that take advantage of that are actually doing very good things for their own career. Right. We have to, we have to get out of just a theater mindset. Okay. Look, I love the theater. Don't get me wrong. But, but I think we need to share more of ourselves on social media, especially these young, beautiful dancers that everybody, they have these beautiful bodies. Everybody loves seeing them, right? They need to spend mm-hmm. more time in front of the camera and start posting more, more pictures, more videos, share more content, right? A ballet company should be sharing more. Um, they should adopt what's called the freemium model, right? So they should, mm-hmm. they should start including more dances for free and putting that on YouTube. Right, the the old mentality is like if you put these things for free, nobody's going to come see it. No, it's just the opposite. The more free stuff you put out there, the more the more you hook people in to come see the real thing, right? Mm Because once they've seen everybody, everybody heard Taylor Swift a million times on the radio, on on YouTube, right? Why are they still packing the stadiums to go see her live? Right, it's silly. The it, just because you put the content out there free, it doesn't mean they're going to stop wanting to see you live, mm-hmm. right? Because if, if that was true, nobody would nobody would not want to go see Taylor Swift. Yeah, right. Because you, you you can see her anytime you want on YouTube, on Instagram. You can you can you can listen to her songs all you like. Why why go see her live? Right. So I think I think uh, you know ballet for training for performance for selling tickets. They, they, they have to start putting, there's not enough free content, right? I shouldn't just have to look at these pirated YouTube videos from Russia, right? So the, mm-hmm. the only way you can see Russian ballet right now is to look up the pirated video channels on YouTube. Like people sneak a camera in and film it yeah. from, a, 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 from a bad angle and then they put it on YouTube. And then that's the only way we can see these videos, right? I think they should be putting up more formal performances with a better better camera quality, uh, better camera placement, multiple 4K cameras, right? Get the best quality you can. Put out a great product. Put it on YouTube for free, and then have people rush in, right? And that's mm-hmm. going to be better for everybody. And I think that I really think that's the future of the dance world. And it sounds simple, but I, I, it's just not being done enough. Nice up. I agree. I agree with that. Right. I, I like. Um. I've. I don't know. Maybe I've never seen your company on YouTube. Uh, no, it's never. It's, it has never been. Right. So I, I have no idea who but, they um, are. I, I have no interest because in if I don't see who you guys are, why would anybody else care? Yeah. Right. And I look for the stuff. But uh, even in the city, I uh, uh, I, I had many discussions. Where, with the company about the, the way that the social media works and yeah. and uh, again making the comparison with any other business if you want to make sales you need to spend uh, the same money that you want to to sell like uh, advertisement is so important marketing is so important uh, even even the biggest brands in the world spend millions and millions every year right to sell, to keep selling. What do you, why do you think that you will sell tickets without any marketing? Right. And YouTube is free. Instagram is free marketing. Y- yes. <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're saying you can put out a commercial of your product for free. Right. One of the most frustrating things in the world is that um, Sylvie Guillaume, we all, well, you know, number one, number two dancer in the world, right? How much mm-hmm. video is there of her? Yeah. Right? There's not much video. And, and what video we have is grainy, it's terrible quality video, right? Well, why didn't we get some 8, 8K footage of her when she was in the final years of her career, right? Mm-hmm. To me, video is like uh, immortality, right? When you put these videos out there, it never dies, right? 
it, it, you you have this for eternity. People a hundred a thousand mm-hmm. years from now will be able to go back and look at these videos, but they'll never be able to see Sylvia Guillem more than a little postage stamp video. Yeah. Right. And now it's too late. Now now she's retired. We we, we can't go back and film her. Right. And 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 I think she was one of those people. She didn't like being filmed. I think she did, she just didn't like it. I, I I'm not hundred percent sure on that. But I think it's such a shame because I I want the next generation to see. I want I want them to see her in in the full glory. Like there's movies from 1950s that 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 uh, were shot on 70 millimeter uh, film, and they they can mm-hmm. they can up convert it to 4K now, and you can still see movies shot in 1950s in beautiful 4K. Why why don't we have that for ballet? There's also one more thing that you you say right at the beginning of the of the video, because you were in the classroom with girls and their developers were higher than yours, then you were forced to work to get your developer higher. And that can translate to, because I think this is a big problem in ballet world. If you can access the best in the world at doing something and you can compare your tension with them, uh, the, the growth will be much faster. Right. Because, because it's the best. This is the best. This is like, you, you, can, you can say like, you can believe that what they are doing has uh, some uh, meaning and that you, you can uh, compare what, what you are doing with what they are doing. And this is something that, for example, in ballroom dance, uh, dancers can get paid for the best teachers in the world. It's very expensive, but they can do that. In ballet, Like if I would like to take class with someone really famous that I think has a great knowledge, it's almost impossible. Yeah. And I, I, and I think that... that that's something that has to be, we need to overcome well, that. I, I we think, need to be able to access. I think just with the media that we have now, this is one of the reasons that the level of dancing has gone up so much in the last 10 years. I think it's just the availability of YouTube and Instagram. Uh, we were never, when I was coming up in the 90s, you, know, you had these old VHS tapes. You didn't, ha- you didn't have access. You couldn't see much, right? Mm-hmm. So... Your your typical guy that developed in the 1990s was you know like below hip level. It, it was never mm-hmm. like this, right? Arabesque was super low. The heel was very low. The passe was like mid calf, right? It was mm-hmm. very it, it was very very rare for someone to have the guys to have lines like the girls. Very rare, right? Oh, you you had to go to you had to go to the best companies in the world, world to see that, but now. What I'm seeing is that even in the small companies, even in the, the small regional companies, I'm, I'm seeing dancers that I would, would have expected to see at Paris Opera in the 1990s. Mm-hmm. Right? The, the level of technique now that I see in a regional dance company is as good as the best in the world in the 1990s. And I think, I think having access to the media has a lot to do with that. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, that's my message to the ballet world. You know, uh, let's, you know, let's keep the traditions that are good, but adopt, that doesn't, doesn't mean you have to stop adopting new traditions. Mm-hmm. We, should, we should be adopting new technology, new knowledge, right? The, 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 the rest of the world, the rest of the sports world, um, figure skating, uh, Olympic diving, they've been studying video since... The 1960s and the 1970s, the sprinters, they study the video. That's something that's not been done in the ballet world even today. Not well, other than what I'm trying to do. I, I don't see mm-hmm. anyone else trying to publish pictures of analysis of people doing slow motion. I just I just don't see that. So I'm trying to change it. Hopefully, you know, more people will will adopt this information. Yeah. And uh, as a last question that I have for you is, uh, what advice would you give to students and teachers? There is some, there is something specific that you, you what would advice? say. Or, well, I mean, they can you follow your say. blog. They can follow your blog. They can follow my mm-hmm. blog, right? Um, mm-hmm. they, they can get the most up to date information um, from online now. There's a lot of information. Don't just stick to the old way of doing things, adopt new technology, watch a lot of YouTube, dance, study it, right? 
the, the, your learning should not stop in the classroom, right? Your stretching cannot be done in the classroom. You, if you want to get good, stretch at home, okay? Don't listen to those people that say, don't stretch, don't do static stretching. That's nonsense. Like I, I'm, I'm hearing so many teachers that say, don't stretch. Like I, I'm, I'm thinking, are you crazy? There's, there's, why would you not do that? I'm looking at these students. I, I walk into a classroom with teenagers. I'm 50. I, I tell these girls, I'm 50 years old. I, my leg should not be higher than your leg. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm old. I'm fatter now. I'm older. Um, my, my I, I'm not as strong and my legs are here. Your legs are here. You, you, you need to be at least what I'm doing. Right. So stretching should be done at home. Studying should be done at home. If you really want to get good, do the stretch at home. Study the tutorials online. Look at the elite dancers. Look at videos of yourself and then compare them. Right? We have the technology. You have the free software. All the software is free. All the videos are free. Look at this. Look at, look at, take advantage of the technology and you will get good really fast. And this goes for the teachers and the students, not just, not just the students. That's great. Well, for everyone, uh, of course, down in the description will be all the links to, to George's website and to his Instagram and his videos. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much. It was, a, it was an incredible conversation. I, I could go for hours with this. Uh, but I think we, we got the insights of many important topics. I think uh, we opened the conversation for many people to have as well, which is my, my goal with these podcast videos. Uh, we need conversations about ballet. We need to, to get out to what everyone thinks and understand that um, not everything is in a book. There are many ways that we can research. There are many ways that we can find what works for our bodies. Ballet is open for everyone and not just for the, for the best in the world. And uh, I'm just glad. I'm really happy that we, we were able to record this and to have this conversation. Great. Thank you for having me.